All right, well, we're getting the next uh, set of slides up. I'll just uh, remind you, I'm Joe Underhill. I, I'm going to talk a lot about a project that is attempting to sort of pull together some pieces or connect um, some of what you're hearing about as these field stations, different sites along the river that will be uh, places for investigation and uh, creativity and uh, public conversations of various sorts. Um, and I think which uh, collectively we hope, again, will lead to a, some really interesting work next fall uh, down in New Orleans at the, head, at the, at the mouth of the, of the river. Um, so you know, stay tuned for more of that to come. But one part of that uh, that, I've, that I've been working on for a number of years now is, to, is sort of getting students out onto the river itself and sort of viewing the river as an Anthropocene object itself to sort of interrogate it, to sit with it, to listen to it, uh, and see what kinds of uh, lessons, observations, new imaginaries might come from spending time on the river itself. Uh, I was glad that Bernd started by saying something about a, an adventure, um, which was part of my personal response to uh, encountering the Anthropocene as yet another layer in what I've seen, you know, experienced as a series of ongoing disasters, right? This, is, this adds another layer, I think, on top of all of these previous forms of colonialism, imperialism, and, you know, genocide and all, you know, nuclear war, and all these things that uh, we in, have to encounter as, as humans living in, in this modern era. This particular disaster added on top of these others prompted me really to engage in a kind of uh, act of protest, uh, stepping out of institutional boundaries um, and common practices out of rooms like this, um, and to sort of stage a, a walkout, uh, if you will, a boat out, a paddle out, a, a great deceleration. deceleration uh, we, we've talked of. Uh, encounter to the great acceleration. And that meant to go out on the river, uh, to slow down, to start paddling. And so in the last uh, few years, I've been taking uh, students out. A few years ago, we, we did a, a trip going for the whole fall semester all the way down the Mississippi River in, in canoes. Um, and uh, I'll share a little bit of what we encountered along the way and uh, a little bit about what is coming up um, both with another expedition this fall and, and then a, a following uh, expedition next fall in 2019 as part of this Anthropocene uh, project. So um, we have, uh, and yeah, I'm afraid these are slightly outdated slides, but um, just to say that what we've done in the past and what we will have coming up is, a, is this expedition starting in the fall, uh, is launching actually August 24th from uh, Minneapolis here, going for 100 days downstream um, with a lot of guest lecturers and people we engage with along the way, including many of the colleagues you've been hearing from uh, this afternoon and evening. Um, and I want to just draw your attention to that picture there. That's one of the campsites where we stayed uh, on the last trip. And um, it's, uh, it's in amongst a bunch of what are called black willows um, in the Batcher land. This is the land between the river and the levees in the lower river. This is in, I believe, uh, technically Arkansas at that point. And um, we're sleeping there in what would be and was uh, the Mississippi River earlier in the year and later in the year. So we were literally sleeping in the once and future river itself. That is to say the river height fluctuates and drops so much over the course of its year in the seasonal pulse that, you know, if we were there four months earlier, we would be underwater. And there was this really sort of surreal experience of sleeping and dreaming in a space that where fish had been swimming. Um, uh, not that long ago and would be again. And so it sort of seemed evocative of the sense of time, of experiencing what the river had been in this, in this wonderful seasonal scale that we haven't really named yet, but which is a really key part of what rivers do, right, is the seasonal pulse, this kind of almost like you can feel it in your veins. Uh, 
And um, so that was just one part of the experience that was very evocative for us, and I think might invite us into thinking about that both once and future river and what we get from uh, sleeping in it. Um, the kinds of activities we do include, you know, standard sort of classroom stuff on a range of different topics. This is, a, here's a lecture in a campsite with some, tr some wonderful trailers and mobile, you know, campers in the background there. Um, this was in Iowa. And it just uh, goes to the range of different uh, kinds of combinations of subject matter, um, both embodied and much more abstract from astronomy to yoga to stream ecology that we cover in the, on the trip. Um, we encounter lots of things along the way, and I'm just going to lift up a couple of them, um, and then, and then uh, we'll, we can move on. But this is a, a picture um, from uh, Pool Nine, it's called. There's Harper's Ferry there um, on the Iowa-Wisconsin border there. And I just want to point out again this notion of sort of the once and future river. Um, we, as you'll probably know, have these series of uh, dams going down from here to just above Iowa. I mean, sorry, just above St. Louis. And you see here what happens when the dam goes in where below downstream you have this really rich, amazingly variegated uh, not quite primal, but uh, much closer to what it was like pre-settlement, what's called an anastomosed stream. It's a, it's a great term about these sort of braided channels that characterize the river in the stretch, and it's just beautiful landscape. And then upstream, you have the inundation of that same landscape. So again, this sort of dreamy image where you can see this sort of palimpsest, if you will, little shadows of submerge of what the islands uh, and channels used to be. Um, and they're still there underwater again. Um, and you can, from, the, from, the, from above, from, from space, you can see them. And to some degree, you can experience them, particularly when you run aground on some of the trees uh, as you're paddling it as well. So that was just one you have this repeated occurrence, this sort of eternal recurrence, at least 27 times going downstream of going into a pool and having the pool sort of, you know, submerge the old river and then you reemerge on the other side of the dam and there's kind of this new river and then it slowly disappears again. And you, you have this interesting cyclical uh, experience of what the, how the river has been shaped uh, along the way. And I don't, yeah, I don't have a picture of it, but there's, uh, I meant to include uh, places where the Army Corps of Engineers and the local DNRs are rebuilding the islands as well. Again, in this amazingly anthropocenic, anthropogenic pattern and process of, of resurfacing the islands um, to create new habitat um, that sort of mimics what was there before. Um, so uh, it's a whole nother great uh, sort of topic for, for discussion um, that I won't go into now. Um, one site that just really uh, relates very much to the whole corn and soybean story um, that we stumbled across in our journey downstream just south of Burlington, Iowa. And this is, uh, this is of course, uh, a plant using the, the Haber-Bosch process that was referenced earlier to create anhydrous ammonia. And, you know, maybe an unsurprising story, except we, we learned from a, a local scaffolding worker, a guy who had been hired uh, in the chronically poverty-ridden uh, community there to build, work building scaffolding, that this was owned by an Egyptian company, Roscom, uh, which made, raised some eyebrows for us. We thought, well, what was an Egyptian company doing, building a $2 billion dollar uh, anhydrous ammonia plant here in Weaver, uh, Iowa. Uh, and of course it had to do with the story uh, going back to other dams were probably mentioned, right? In this case, the Aswan High Dam that starved the lower Nile River of its annual pulse and all the nutrients that came with it that then required the production of uh, large scale anhydrous ammonia fertilizer plants in Egypt, so they got very good at that and then have decided now that there was 
uh, um, ample supply of the newly fracked natural gas available in the region that this would be a good place to build a plant. Um, lots of other dimensions to this story, um, but this is a huge facility. I had never heard about it until we paddled down the river and, and stumbled across this. And again, you know, we huge uh, uh, undertaking um, with these interesting global connections uh, to the Nile. Um, so there's lots of these kinds of uh, fairly disturbing, discouraging stories, I think. But I, again, going back to other fish stories, I just kind of like to include some of these. This is one of the students holding another wonderful species, a 75 million year old species that is still in the river, the paddlefish um, that we were able to uh, sample a little bit. Don't worry, no, no fish were harmed in the process of uh, staging this photo um, and it was re returned safely to the water and I'm sure is still living happily there. Um, but it's, um, um, it's just an amazing creature to have there. And, and again, going it's sort of thinking about the, the fossil record and the fossil life that's still there, so to speak, something that is still managed despite everything we have thrown at this river. To, to, to continue. So there, was, there were a lot of stories like that too. And then when we think about these futures, I think about a lot of those kinds of stories as well. Uh, one person I know we'll be connecting with on this trip next year um, as we do the lower river um, is this guy, John Rusky, who is another just incredibly inspiring uh, person and personality on the river. I know a few people in the room here have worked with him before. He's um, uh, someone who is about as connected, I think, as one can be to the Mississippi. And here he is sketching out, as you can see, in the sand deposited by the river itself, a map of the river, uh, showing us the shape of the river in the river um, on land that, again, would be underwater. You can even see kind of in the upper left-hand corner there some of the, um, the what are called the subaqueous dunes, the sort of sand deposition that happens in the river. So you get this real, very visceral sense of the, um, of what the river does and what it's like underwater there. Um, and again, someone who's doing amazing work in sort of connecting people to the river um, in uh, mostly out of Clarksdale, Mississippi, where he, where he works. Um, and just kind of a, a closing picture, again, I think there is a sense of, of joy and hopefulness and wisdom that we experienced in traveling along the river that we, like I am just, uh, in the face of the Anthropocene, uh, I think is uh, something that we need vitally to sort of hang on to. And we've talked in other parts of our discussion the last few days about health issues, the opioid epidemic, the forms of depression and other kinds of maladies that come along with Anthropocene. And we have found great antidotes and alternatives to that in some of this direct encounters with the, the river itself. Um, these are, I, don't know, I can tell you lots of stories about this, but that picture says, speaks volumes to what what hope and joy we can find in living into um, some of these uh, direct encounters with the river and some of the possible futures that come out of those encounters. Thanks.